Hey everyone, Duke Nuked 3 d here with another informative type of video. And you may recall in the last uh, sort of mask physiological analysis, I covered mostly head harnesses, but today we're going to be talking about facial seals because that is, by doubt, without a doubt, one of the most important factors in purchasing a gas mask. And this is not as much more going to be a buying guide as it is just a general analysis of the various principles of gas mask facial seals throughout history and their just their typical tendencies to paste on uh, cultural and racial background. So this is going to be a, just a partial on-camera review just so I can sit down over here, not obstruct the light, and just be able to handle masks. So when I, I'm mostly going to be focusing on Western and communist block designs because they're sort of a very weird contrast between the two. So starting with the U.S., um, ever since the tail end of World War I, there has been a very heavy focus around sealing around the temples and the cavernous regions of the face, as I've mentioned plenty of times before. And if you go and look at my Akron TISA reviews, there was plenty of study put into the mechanical and physiological forces that act upon the seal of a gas mask. For instance, um, this is sort of why that I don't test masks or recommend masks for buying, um, just because really it's all dependent on what your facial properties are, what your correct size is, and buying a gas mask and, and clear checking it and sealing it through the negative positive and negative pressure seal checks is not adequate enough to determine a proper seal in a gas mask because you will potentially have leaks that are like that are undetectable to normal human breathing resistance just because the resistance of the leak is so little and so fine that you will not be able to notice it in the under 10 seconds that you are clearing and sealing the mask. And using a test like banana oil, if you have access to it or, de or decide to spend the money on it, is also important that you test it properly because doing a, a test with your facial features at rest, simply just inhaling and exhaling without making any sort of facial movements at all or doing any sort of thing like that, is only about 30% of being able to determine if the mask properly seals you because things such as movement of the brow, the temples, the rotation and uh, movement of the jaw all may have deciding factors on whether or not the mask breaks its seal on your particular face. And so if you do test masks and you do intend to use a mask and you do buy a mask off of the surplus market without a buyer's assurance of your personal protection, I would definitely recommend being very thorough in your testing procedures with banana oil um, where you would potentially rotate your jaw, move your eyes, uh, move your brow up and down, things of that nature, and then also potential stress on the mask. Aside from facial movements, there, there's also the risk where if the mask is has some sort of external mechanical force applied to it, such as bumping the canister or you know just anywhere on the mask, it may create a sort of divot or, or a, a crease which may break the seal and render the protective qualities inoperable. So. That being said, let's get back into the physiological study of American masks throughout history. One of the biggest studies that, uh, that the U.S. has put on, the, on masks since the end of World War I, which again, we're using this 1943 M3 diaphragm as an example, most U.S. masks throughout history have most of the pressure of the face seal applied to the temples. So as you can see, um, you may notice this on a lot of American designs, that the temple straps will be anchored close to the eyepieces so that all of the pulling pressure sort of cinches the rubber to create an indentation that fills in the cavernous regions of the temples and the, and the face. And this was to accommodate the fact that you had a very barren face seal. There was absolutely nothing on the inside to create a, um, a, an ex, like a extra level of insurance of seal if you, because obviously America being as multicultural as it is, even for the time where you had a wide variety of racial backgrounds and ergonomics that were um, possibly incapable with one design, whereas others, it, it, it's, it's a good theory to make one mask to fit all, but in terms of U.S. historical design, it does not work out where you have, you know, your, the typical way you do things with just a basic face seal with maybe some texturing on the inside. You, the whole principle was they wanted to have as much pressure 
in the regions where the where there was more than likely to be a leak as possible. Um, so, and that principle is even seen today on modern masks, such as this US M45. Um, as you can see, the temple straps have the, this molded bridge. Um, I'm sure I pointed this out in my M45 review, where as the harness is taut, it creates, as this strap naturally wants to lay flat against the face blank, it, this little bridge will create pressure into the temples and cause the mask to seal better in those cavernous regions of the face. And this mask also has another feature which was introduced, which is um, another thing to, uh, important to point out with gas mask design, is an internal face seal, the, the intern peripheral face seal. And the advantage to a peripheral face seal and why most modern masks today will have this feature is because essentially you have a free-floating cushion which will apply itself to all of the crevices and odd curvatures of the human face the, irregardless of race um, and abnormalities in facial structure. And that is a very important thing to consider when buying a mask is the overall sealing capability of the face seal and, and this periphery because some, some may be larger than others, some may be closer to the edge than others, some may jut out further than others. Generally it's regarded that the further the face seal sticks out and the more cushiony it is, such as on the Avon S10 or other Avon masks in general, it is a very good seal and it can fit a wider variety of face. And some companies have either, even often opted to make a double seal to fit more facial sizes than the mask is recommended for. Um, and this this works in principle, but it is also at sacrifice of the mask's general comfort from what I have noticed personally. However, this may not be the case with all examples. Um, moving on to Russian masks, and potentially the reason why I see these being so popular with today's you know GP5 kiddos and all that is because they do not need an, inter an integrally molded face seal. They do not need special attention paid to the location of the harness tabs and how they apply pressure to the various regions of the face because essentially it is a big rubber bag that overcompensates for the lack of sealing technology that these masks will often bear. And so essentially at the sacrifice of the mask's overall structural integrity and at the sacrifice of the end user's comfort, it will apply a broader range of facial sealing um, to the various because uh, you have to imagine, Russia, like America, is a very diverse country. It has many different racial and cultural backgrounds in it. And so it was much easier for them to try and design one mask to fit all rather than to consider each facial anatomy and try and tackle each individual point um, where the mask may or may not seal, such as with U.S. designs. And this is even seen in modern Russian masks, such as the PMK series, where they do have an intern peripheral face seal, but that that free-floating cushion principle is over-exaggerated, where like a Schlem Mosca or helmet mask, you have an excess of material that is meant to overcompensate the lack of overall physiological study that is put into um, see, creating a seal on these masks. And then you have some countries which are entire, which, you know, because they are they don't have very many indigenous cultures. It is basically just one race for the most part, such as with Chinese masks, like the Type 64, that gives them the, the freedom to create, to not really consider as much sizing. However, they still, it's very neat to see masks where they're pretty much designed with their racial background uh, ma majority in mind, because although the, the, such as the Type 64 here, you can see that they put a lot of, um, thought into how they how the mask will seal against the cavernous regions of the face for instance they have molded pockets here i've mentioned this before the most chinese masks will have molded pockets to seal against the temples and then they'll also have a forehead ridge um, so that the a, a great area of the face blank will lie flat against the face while also providing that distance for the eyepieces to stick out in front of the eyes and not interfere with uh, you know, anything underneath being too close to the face. It, it creates a little bit more ample space for the, the nose to stick out and so on and so forth. And later iterations of Chinese masks, these, these racially focused principles can still be seen because with the uh, FMJ05 and FMJ06A, like this mask, um, although the free-floating um, peripheral face seal is a principal feature in here, 
it seems that it is specifically designed to not cover a wide variety of faces, given the fact that this peripheral seal lies very flat. It does not cushion out as far as some Western masks. And then also, the internal oro nasal cup here has absolutely no regard for various facial sizes and is more of a dam because this upper portion of the nose cup is actually meant to seat against the bridge of the nose in between the eyes while the rest of the nose sits in this pocket down in here which this principle works very well and was designed for asian facial ergonomics but on a western face it does not work that well because the nose naturally on western faces will like to sit around the top bridge of the oral nasal cup and not really regard this pocket down here so this nose cup is entirely different in principle to most uh, moderate or nasal cups where the, the top of the cup seals against the, the middle bridge of the nose, not directly between the eyes. It can, but for the most part, a majority of the seal is carried out throughout the middle bridge of the nose and not directly between the eyes, such as on the Chinese masks. Um, but again, very interesting to note how this mask has been carefully designed to fit Asian facial ergonomics and uh, undoubtedly it works very well on, in those regards and even on my face uh, there are many principles involved in Chinese masks that work very well but ultimately the problem with gas masks today is that you'll have countries that design them for specific again specific racial backgrounds and there really is no indicative way to find that out other than just assuming so because you'll have most Western manufacturers such as MSA, Avon, etc. will try and accommodate various racial backgrounds and facial features through just mechanically developing the masks to cover all those bases moderately whereas you have some companies that uh you know manufacturing for their own com uh, countries indigenous militaries that will design the masks specifically to fit the country's racial background just one so that is a very important thing to consider in regards to purchasing masks for personal protection is that the the principles behind the face seal are probably the most important thing that you'll need to consider because you in addition to sizing there's just a whole slew of things that you need to consider you need to remember humans are not mass produced no two humans are exactly the same and there are tons of abnormalities so you need to know what exactly fits you and making sure it seals with the proper due processes for testing involved so that being said i hope you learned a thing or two and if you have any comments questions corrections or concerns drop them down in the comments below i'm duke new with 3d and i'll see you all later